we have Daniel Burnham with us this evening, his former chairman of the board and CEO of Raytheon Company. He received his bachelor's degree in economics from Xavier University in 1968 and master's of business administration from the, from the University of New Hampshire in 1970. Dan held positions increase, with increasing responsibility with the car, Carborundum, I might have butchered that company, from 1971 to 1982, and joined Raytheon from Allied Signal Incorporated, where he most recently served as vice chairman and a member of the board of directors. He is currently a director, board, board advisor, past chairman, member, and trustee of many leading companies, um, committees, and councils across the nation. Along with his incredible knowledge and experience, Dan has been presented with honorary degrees from Pepperdine University and Bentley College. So thank you again for joining us. You. you have some technical issues here, but that's okay. I'm going to talk to you about technology management, technology and management. And I'm going to start with this basic premise. My guess is you all probably believe it at one level or another if you thought about it very much. And that is our very way of life, the way we live our days, is dependent on our country's mastery of technology. Our, li our lifestyle is dependent on it. The source of our prosperity is technology. And I've worked in technology careers, uh, uh, companies my entire career. I decided from the beginning that I wanted to go where it all started. Not in finance, which, you know, it might grease the skids and provides the capital, but without something to invest in, who needs it? How many lawyers, advertisers, communicators would we have if we weren't the world's leaders in innovation? What would our living standards be if AT&T hadn't invented the transistor? What would our living standard be if Intel didn't put the power of what used to be a room-sized computer on a chip? Where would we be if Michael Dell hadn't figured out a way to build PCs to spec in a day in a dorm room at the University of Texas? Where would we be if DARPA hadn't worked with professors from another well-known school 100 miles south of here and some other institutions if they hadn't invented the DARPA net, which we all know, know it's called something different. Our, as I say, our whole very way of life would be different. Now, I suppose somebody could get philosophical and, about all this and say, well, maybe we're better off if all this stuff hadn't happened. I guess my answer to that is anybody's welcome to move out and get out of this world of constant upheaval which is caused by all this technical innovation. But, like, where would you go? This is indeed a revolution without any bounds. Now, the bedrock of all this is our engineering and applied science community. Without you, we don't have any of this stuff. It sure isn't guys like me who got trained in finance. We wouldn't have instant worldwide connections if you waited around for me to invent it. It's you who really are the necessary element of our prosperity. Necessary you are, but you're not sufficient. Imagine if you were all let loose with all your technical genius, without any process discipline, without access to resources, without focus on something valuable to somebody who's willing to pay for it. Technology without management is a playpen. So back to you, the necessary ones. Our engineers and applied scientists. We in our country are losing our competitive edge because we don't have enough of you coming through the universities. Of course, this is like speaking to the choir. I'm going to rail about not having enough engineers coming through. And who am I talking to engineers? Yes, go ahead. Well, I heard that, I mean, this is a statistic when I was coming to school, or about the years in school, I heard that if you're a science, if you're an engineer, you'll not be able to find a job when you graduate because they that you will not have the job available for them. Untrue. Uh, qu uh, can you all hear? Okay. Uh, this gentleman said, but I hear that there's not going to be enough jobs for us getting out. Well, I'll give you, like, 
an example of this. Uh, the predictions are we're going to need another 50% of the engineers that we have today over the next seven or eight years. I forgot the exact deal. This little company right here in town is the biggest industrial employer is Raytheon. They have 65 open requisitions for engineers. 65 open requisitions. So uh, there's going to be huge opportunities. But you know, uh, other countries have figured out why we have the mastery of technology. It's our universities. They figured it out. So what did they do? They built their own capabilities. And why shouldn't they? And we have this arrogance here that we've got the best mousetraps, they will come, presuming that they're not going to build their own. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Indian Institute of Technology. It would knock your socks off. You know, it's much harder to get into the uh, ITT than it is to get into MIT. Much harder. And yet it's a bigger school because they got a lot more people to draw from. God didn't give us the rights to be the world's teachers in technologies. So you think that the Indians sort of feel a little bit of confidence in this arena. How about the Chinese? The Europeans? Look, our universities indeed turn out a lot of grads, but increasingly these grads are not coming out of the engineering departments. Do you know that the U.S. is in, the, is in the 17th place among countries in the ratio of engineering and science grads to total grads. Now even if we get the high school grads to enter the field as freshmen into engineering programs, only 40% graduate. Only 40%. This year there's going to be 61,000 engineering degrees granted in the U.S. 134,000 in Europe. Old Europe, dead, declining Europe. We have twice as many engineers graduating this, this year. 195,000 in China. But only 40% of the grad students in engineering programs in the U.S. universities are U.S. born. 60% are foreign born. Now where do you think these foreign born students are going to go to work? It used to be an absolute given that they're going to work here. Yeah? Have you been to Bangalore lately? Wow! The place is, it's like a revolution. I went there a few years ago to show you how smart I am so you'll know how close not to listen to me. Have you ever, I don't know if you ever heard of Widpro, W-I-P-R-O. It's like one of the biggest companies in India now. I went to Bangalore, I don't know, maybe it was 10 years ago. And I visited them and there was four people in this dark, dingy place. They're trying to get some business from me. Even suggesting maybe I'd invest in it. I didn't. It shows how stupid I am. This is a huge operation. I don't know how many tens of thousands of people that they have. Now I can assure you that corporate America is worried about this. And taking it seriously, indeed my successor is CEO at Raytheon, Bill Swanson, is chairing the Business Higher Education Forum initiative on mathematics. A lot of people are talking about it and worrying about it, but this problem's not going to get fixed overnight. And I'm not here to try to convince you all to change it. I'm going to try to talk about what are the implications of this for you. So the U.S. clearly has a major problem in our education system. But as I say, that's not the problem I'm going to talk to you about. Given that we are where we are, and given that it's a truism that technology has created our wealth, we inexorably find that our focus in business and in universities must be in dramatically increasing the effectiveness of each and every precious graduate. We don't have enough graduates. We have to maintain our competitive edge, so we have to make each and every one of you dramatically more effective than your predecessors have been. We must be the most productive employer of technologists in the world in order to offset our weakening relative position in terms of the numbers of technologists. But you know, it's not technology for technology's sake that I'm up here talking to you. It's technology that using Peter Drucker's fra phrase, technology that creates societal value. 
innovation that improves the human condition, innovation that creates economic value. There, there's an absolute in the world of technology management. The endeavor's got to be focused on the user, the market, or the customer, not on the product. Engineers will spend their lives trying to get a product marginally improved. What matters is that somebody's willing to pay for it, which means the user determines it. I have no idea how much of our technology resources are misspent each year on this hell-bent search for meaningless product features due to the engineer's love of the product, but it's huge. We were, my former company, the owners of the world of this particular technology, which I'm not going to go into because I'm being taped here, but we owned it. Multi-billion dollar business. We knew everything about it. We invented it. We were the scientists and the technologists behind this product. We knew more about it than our customers did. But over time, our customers actually had the arrogance of suggesting to us changes in the product and in the technology. We kept saying to the customer, because we were focused on the product, so you don't understand, customer, we're, we're the inventors of this. We are the, indeed the rocket scientists. So the customer in his naivety decided, maybe I'll talk to somebody else out there. He found somebody else who said, Boy, I don't know if I can do it, but I'm going to sure try. That person went and developed the product the customer want and walked off with a multi-billion dollar business. We had the smartest technologists in the world. They had people who listened to the customer. But you know, not all innovation is technology-based. Think of Toyota's invention of lean manufacturing. It has changed the world. Michael Dell picked up those principles while still a kid at the University of Texas in his dorm room and applied it to the world of PCs. And he's created more wealth in the last 10 years than nearly any other person. Innovation. Fred Smith invented Federal Express in a paper he wrote at the Harvard Business School. Innovation. Now, so there are examples of that brilliant if not idiosyncratic technologist or innovator screaming Eureka as he or she invents something or perfects something. But there's also a truism that for every dollar spent on idea generation, ten dollars are spent on research. For every ten dollars spent on research, a hundred dollars is spent on development. For each of those $100, another $1,000 to $10,000 is spent to introduce a product to the market. The point is, most innovation isn't the Eureka. Most innovation requires lots of resources. It requires organization. It requires management for successful value creation. I'm going to quote Drucker again. Companies that aren't capable of innovation are doomed. Management that doesn't know how to manage innovation is incompetent. Yes? So then, wouldn't the U.S. universities bring out more and more majors and non-engineering majors? Yes. Would actually be a good thing since we're bringing out more people who are able to do the harder part of innovation? No, we need, we need technologists who can also manage. You can actually walk and chew gum. It's not like you guys invent and us guys control you. It's the fusion of this that's so important. And one reason, really, that I'm here and that I like UCSB so much is you are role models of integration, of fusion. Uh, the, the, new, the new nanoscience um, commitment here is proof positive of it. I think it's going to be fascinating when you get uh, these people from all these disparate science, sciences thrown into one, I was going to say little building, yeah, not little, but throw into one little building and see what sparks come out. There's going to be a lot of sparks, but it's going to be wonderful. So this whole point, of it's the fusion of management and technology. Do not think 
that it's the engineers who come out and then the management people who come out and they sort of stay in their own worlds and wonderful things happen. It's just the opposite. That was my point. I'm a management guy. I couldn't invent anything. If it was up to me, we'd have nothing. So we find ourselves at the nexus of innovation and management. Now this is the stuff I understand that you all want to do. That's why you're here. Technology management. Think of the value that's been created in the past few years by the masters of the fusion of innovation and management. Intel, 3M, a wonderful company. How about Apple? GE, Walmart, not technology, but it, well, on one level it's not technology. They would argue that the heart of the Walmart revolution is information technology. Is this my fault that this is making that noise? Or? What? You're kidding. Why didn't you tell me? You see, you wanted to prove that I'm stupid on technology. It really is? I just did. It says goodbye. Isn't that a good thing? Well, it was me. Okay. So, Walmart, Cisco, Washington Mutual. EMC, Starbucks, now there's innovation. Maybe 20 years ago, I came back from a trip to Europe with my wife. We had spent a lot of time in coffee shops. I said, you know, we really ought to get in this coffee business. I mean, imagine if we had it on street corners in America, everybody would come. Yeah, right, it's a great idea. Well, I went back to work hard and I didn't have any time to think about it and how many times have I regretted that one? But that's innovation. And then the whole FedEx Kinko's thing is certainly a great in, uh, example of the fusion of innovation and management. Now look, I've not worked at any of those places, but I've thought a bit about the subject. And I proudly managed a major turnaround at a technology-based national treasure in Raytheon. The company went through a great deal of turbulence, along with the entire defense industry, after the consolidation of the defense industry attendant to the near collapse in defense spending in the years after the Gulf War. How would you like it if your market went out, declined by 60% in about three years? Well, we found ourselves after that with way too much capacity, too many people, too much debt, some businesses that needed fixing, and not enough cash. But we did have 30,000 engineers and a depth of, and breadth of technology second to none. So I had to deal with the issues I've just put to you. How do we become masters of successful innovation, the kind that creates value, the only kind that matters, by managing this engineering dominant enterprise well? Well, I guess I should give you the punchline so that you have at least some reason to believe that I might say something of use here. Since these dark times, economic value, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, and cash are all way up, and debt is way down. It's been a truly successful transition. Let's talk about management. I'm sure you've all been taught that it includes things like planning and controlling and organizing and allocating. Those terms all, you've probably heard all those terms. But have you heard that it also includes envisioning, engaging, exciting, and executing, meaning getting it done? In the old days, management was controlling, avoiding conflict avoiding risk, keeping things together, and keeping it safe. Bosses know and employees do and complain a lot in the process. Lots of committees, lots of rules. Strive above all for organizational harmony. Can you imagine that philosophy really working today? Look, it might have been okay when it was invented, and it was invented, it indeed was an innovation, by Alfred Sloan, the chairman of GM in the 20s. And it worked 
pretty well right up till the mid 1970s. The most successful enterprise, business enterprise on the planet was General Motors in the mid 70s. Remember though when you guys have read about it, some of you actually remember it, when the Japanese car makers, this is the term that was used, invaded. We thought the problem was their culture or their savings rate or their religion or anything. We thought it was anything other than that they had a profoundly different model than we did and that we better make profound changes. We just didn't believe it. We thought, well, they're, they're Japanese. That's why they do it. Couldn't explain it. Well, they did have a fundamentally different management philosophy and the people that are thriving here today have adopted many of these fundamental changes. The successful companies know that management reflects the world in which we compete. Accept uncertainty. Be confrontational to find out the opportunities and the problem. Seek them out. Talk to people. Find it out. Don't say, I want to control. I want to avoid. No, I want to seek them out. And listen to the experts. And the experts are the people who do the work. The employees, not the bosses. The bosses don't know much of anything. Listen to the employees. Don't order them around. Don't set rules. Set expectations. And cherish values. Don't hire people who are going to make you comfortable. Look for the rebel. The rebel with strong values who can play well with others. Recognize, you future bosses, that the employee is just as smart as you are and that she too wants a stake in the place and cares deeply about the success of her team. Your job as a manager is to envision, to excite, to engage all the stakeholders, and you will be measured relentlessly on what gets done. So let me sort of recap where I am so far in this journey. Technology is absolutely vital to our prosperity. There aren't enough young people coming into the field, so we have to make the most of what we have and encourage more young people to pursue technology as a career. We must be the best at managing technology. While Eurekas are terrific, we can't bet the place on them. We have to bet on management, which I really prefer to call leadership. Now back, back to my Raytheon experience. I said that leadership demands that the leader envisions success. Gives people a reason to come to work. Now my very first day in a job, and I came in as CEO, I put on every single employee's desk a letter. It's 108,000 of them. On my very first day in the job. And I laid out what a successful organization was, asserting that it's what we would become. I said we'd be agile, we'd be values-based, not rules-based, that we'd engage our employees, we'd eliminate as much bureaucracy as possible, and we'd put the customer, not our traditions, at the center of everything that we did. And that got people a-buzzing. And then we had to put in the human resource systems necessary to get our folks to focus on their performance and not waiting around for people to tell them what to do. Don't join big companies that give you a bunch of orders and a bunch of rules. Go to a place that cherishes your individuality. We put in world-class productivity uh, processes to dramatically reduce the waste that's inherent in any organization, big or small. How, how many of you have like been out in the work world, have worked. I mean, you know, seriously worked. Okay. Okay. It, it, hello. Oh, can I keep going here? Okay. Oh, all right. Thank you. So imagine now, those of you who have been working, just try to get yourself back into that. And you see how work took place. Now imagine, compare the work that you saw with what you think would be perfection. That is, if there was no waste, 
in whatever organization you were, if everybody did things that added value as opposed to just controlling, how much more productive could that place be? Double? I can't tell. I'm not getting any feedback from you guys. This, this one guy, this is, my, this is my son, and I've asked him to ask me a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Exponential, right. How about some of you others that have been out there working? Compare the way you saw work to what you think would be if there wasn't any waste. How much difference? 10%. 50%. 100%. Right? Like, really different? Do I, do, are we, like, on the same page here? Right. Imagine if we could get it to be perfect. Imagine. Well, why shouldn't it be? Why shouldn't we drive for elimination of all waste? I'm going to talk more about it. We're still back to what do we do to change things. We laid out some goals, only three. Don't get confused, only three, and talked about them incessantly, over and over and over again. Never changed the, never changed the word, just kept going over it and over and over it, because so, you had to get through lots of people. And after a while, people got the story. I'll give you an example of it. Uh, it's hard to imagine what it's like being a CEO until you've been it. But imagine now you're, you're the boss of a great big organization. You have 200 facilities, and you're on a tour of one of these. The moment you walk in, the first thing you always notice is the smell of fresh paint. I'm sure it's just purely coincidental. And you have this whole team of people all standing there with clean white shirts. And they look like they don't dress that way every day, but they did for you. And they say, let's go on a tour. And so you go on a tour. And they always take you, let's say, left. What do you do? You go right. Because you want to find out what's really going on. Well, who are you going to talk to? The people who know. The people who do the work. So. I did this thing, I went to this place, it was all freshly scrubbed, everything looked great, I deviated uh, right, the management team almost had a coronary, <laughs> and I went over to this woman who had a great big uh, union deal on here. Now, if, if, you're, if you walk into an uh, organization, a union organization, uh, and you're, you're part of a company, and you see people walking around with great big union symbols, it usually means they're not trying to tell you how much they love you. So I went up to this woman, that great big union thing on. I said, what do you do here? Uh, she, and, and all these people are running over to try to get me. She said, well, I'm an inspector. I work on product, I inspect the product. I said, what's important to you around here? What do you think we ought to be doing? She said, I'll tell you what we ought to be doing. We need more cash in this company. I've been talking about this for, I don't know, months and months and months. Cash, cash, cash. If we don't have cash, we can't pay down the debt. I said, what do you think we can do to save the cash? She said, why are you getting rid of all this stupid waste around here? Don't you see how much waste we have? I thought, I got it. This company is now fixed. Because on a random thing, 108,000 people, this one person who might have had an attitude, although I'd, I loved her attitude. You know, I was in a union before I was in management. It was fine with me. So maybe we got this message across. Though I deviate. Engineers are always the most cautious in accepting change. And you know, I don't really know why. I just know it's true from my experience. Maybe it's because engineers have to, are fundamentally analytical, uh, want to get right to the root causes, understand it very well. In fact, any time there'd be any change issued, there'd always be lots of email. I love getting email. And guaranteed that the people with the most issues were the engineers, because they analyzed the heck out of everything you sent them, and they'd find the faults in it, no question about it, so, but sometimes missing the bigger picture of what we're trying to do here. So, in any event, to get the heart of the organization into this, into this revolution, we engaged the employees as broadly as we knew how. Teams of these geniuses, and I mean that literally, regular employees came together in an organized way to examine the way in which engineering tasks and decisions took place. We got the engineers to actually think about the problem. How do we do engineering here? Do we do it perfectly? Why not? And once we got them engaged and get them to understand we have an issue, they'd get lined up. 
Notice that it wasn't top management who got together to figure out how to improve the technology process. It was the guys and gals who did the work. It didn't take long for them to identify the critical elements of making us more productive. Get the customer engaged as fully as possible in determining the product, and then formally include all elements in the value creation process. Suppliers, manufacturers, marketing, finance. Instead of reverting to the traditional engineering model, now listen to this one, of if we design it, someone else can figure out how to make it, and someone else will sell it. Oh, and by the way, these other people, they're not as smart as we are because they're not engineers. Do you know how prevailing that attitude is? It's broadly prevailing. But I think we made terrific progress. But I was still impatient for lots more, just so much more. Then a, a wonderful bit of serendipity fell, in, fell our way. We recognized that learning is a lifelong necessity, so to put our money where our mouth is, we got serious about putting in a top-notch training program about, among other things, technology management. The guy that we did this, uh, we brought in from uh, University of Chicago. He had an endowed chair there. We got him on his, uh, on his uh, what do you take when you take a year off? I just went, his sabbatical, and we extended it to three years, and they allowed him to do it. And it became clear to the two of us, by the way, this guy's a PhD sociologist. It became clear to the, the two of us that there must be something fundamental as to why some employees consistently outperform others. Of course, there's lots of obvious factors. Work ethic, technical competence, curiosity. But we, we found out that the most determinant of all was the ability to work across multiple networks. Look, we're all fundamentally tribal oriented. Cave A, if you are a member of it, is better than Cave B. Any former Marines in here? It would be fun if there were. All the Marines think they're better than anybody in the Army. And everybody in the Army thinks they're better than those jarheads. Because it's the tribes, it just happens. How about UCLA and SC, UCSB? You get into, into any social organization and teams form naturally. Circuit designers talk to other circuit designers. Bioscientists know that the bioscientists are the core of this place and everyone else hangs on. That's just life. But the most successful engineers and employees had a weird trait. We found that they worked both inside the team and outside the team, sometimes across multiple teams. Not because they were organized that way by management. I'm talking about the informal social networks, those who had the skill to work across networks. And after normalizing for pay grades, for years of experience and so on, the bigger, the ra the bigger raises went to those people that interacted the most broadly across the organization. Not Clearly, we always need brilliant scientists, the people that do have the potential of saying Eureka and inventing wonderful things. And we cherish them and love them. But we can't bet the system on it. The people that got promoted and got paid and contributed the most were not the smartest engineers. We had a lot of smart engineers. Everybody was smart. The differentiator were, was those who could actually work with other people. P they, they would actually seek out the manufacturing people, not with a sense of arrogance that, well, I have an engineering degree and you don't. It was, hey, I want to design the best thing. The best thing means people are actually willing to pay for it, and they're going to pay for it because we can make it, and I can't design it if I don't know how we make it, so let's do it together without some boss telling them to do it. Now, this may all seem so obvious, but tribal behavior rules and lots of engineers prefer the solitude of their intellect 
to the reality of social interaction. But for us to win, because we don't have enough graduates, we've got to be the most productive. And the most productive learn and like to work across the boundaries. They look for boundaries not as limits, but as challenges, new learning experiences. Now, how much time do you all spend on learning the skills I'm just talking about? Now, listen to what I said. The predictor of your success, it's presumed that you're highly qualified engineers. The predictors of your success is your ability to network. Now, how much time do you spend learning those skills in the engineering curriculum? And I'm not blaming the engineering department. It takes five years to cram all of Newton's laws into you. It's tough, tough stuff. But there's no talk about it, or relatively little, except for organizations like this and curricula like, like this that are naturally fusion and are going to make a big difference. It's just this stuff that's going to differentiate you from all the others. Social networking is not the tool of the sociologists. It's the enabler for a successful engineer. Yes, sir. Well, one, I don't. It was 108,000. If it was 180, maybe I would have been really worried. Because uh, you, you have structure, you have goals, and you have processes. It's not like everybody suddenly, you can't go out and say to everybody, the company is you. We encourage you to be a rebel. Uh, break the rules. We never said break the rules, but challenge, push back, go. No, 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 no. We didn't say it like that. Tried to get people to think that they were the company. And then we had all this training to go on, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, to put some structure around their freedom. Because you can't just all go crazy. So it, we called it Six Sigma, which is a huge thing. How many of you ever heard the term Six Sigma? It's a really big deal. It's a huge deal. I would encourage you to learn about it. It can really change, the, it does change the way work takes place and it'll improve the productivity of the engineer by a lot. Okay, but that's sort of the point. I, look, we recognize the primacy of technologists, the need for social leadership, for leadership and for social interaction, right? Is all that enough? No, it's not, a, all that stuff, you get all that, it's still not enough for you to have a stellar organization. Your great ideas are really expensive to bring to success under the best of conditions, but prohibitively expensive if you and your organization is not obsessed, and I'm not overstressing the word, obsessed and compulsive about productivity and quality. Quality and productivity are the twins of technology management. How many of you have systematically studied productivity? If you believe me when I say productivity and quality are the twins of technology management, like one of these twins hasn't been paid attention to. Again, it's not, I'm not blaming the engineering curriculum. I, and I'm not a curriculum designer. It's probably a good thing. But if it is indeed a critical element in technology success, I challenge people to say, so find a solution to this. How much of, the tech, of your technology endeavors are wasted? Just think, the work you do, you've been trained for, you go out and it's wasted. How awful is it? It's like to use an old term that's totally out of favor, and I kind of wish I wasn't filmed, but it's a sin almost to put all that effort in, and, and not yours, but I mean the cultural sin. You don't get anything for it. And yet if half of what you do is a waste, isn't that awful? So. If everything worked perfectly every time, we got to the design just right. The customer made no changes. Manufacturing produced no scrap. The suppliers were on time every time. The product worked in the field. How much would we save? The scientific, fact-based answer to that question of how much we could save is lots and lots. 
You could say, hey, the premise is wrong. Perfection is unattainable. I say, so what? I, see, I hate the notion that if we work hard, we can improve things. What? What? Are you crazy? They entrusted you with a big company? See, I, no, because that starts from the notion that where, where we are, we just work harder, we get better. No, that's starting from where we are. Quality starts from the customer. Doesn't start from where we are, starts from where the customer is. And the customer only wants what he wants. He doesn't want to pay for all your stupidity. He only wants what he wants. He's, that's what he's going to pay for. The productive organization figures out what a perfect process would look like precisely and with numbers. That organization would, would look with vigor at how it does things now with precision and numbers. Then that organization rates the, uh, measures the rate of progress between one and the other. Now, two guys started this whole thing. Mr. Ono at Toyota and Robert Galvin at Motorola. Each was motivated to find and eliminate waste for the basest of reasons, survival. Toyota was making a couple thousand cars a day up against the monsters with unlimited capital. He didn't have any. He had to figure out how to make lots of different models without investing in all the tooling and capacity that the mass producers took as gospel. Galvin was making car radios. And his customers were raising hell because every time they drive over a bump, the radio would crap out. You have to be at least my age to remember that. He asked his engineers, take out the defects. They said, no, it's impossible. It's a radio. I mean, it shakes. It's going to, you know, not work. He challenged them. He said, so show me the cause of this imperfection. Once they analyzed it, they said, you know, this old guy might be onto something. They codified this discipline, and they called it Six Sigma. It's really, I'm not overstating it, it's the best thing that's come along in managing institutions since, I don't know, Jack Welsh or Henry Yang. <laughs> Henry, did you get that? Where's the camera? Henry, did you get that? <laughs> Six Sigma puts the hierarchy right on its head. It says that the experts are the workers. The individual contributors, they know what's going on. It gives them the job to define perfection, to assess today, and to use statistical tools to measure defects and variation. And the results are astounding. In our particular case, we saved over $2 billion in four years from these programs. Our employee morale shot up because they were contributing. One customer said, and you're going to think that I made this up, but I didn't. Uh, remember, we were a defense company. He said, because of, if it weren't for Six Sigma, he would have lost troops, meaning killed. Six Sigma and its variations forces the technologist to critically assess what he or she is doing to create value. The technologist becomes the catalyst for excellence. And that brings me back to the beginning. I'm about done here. To sum up, innovation is not measured by the cheers in the labs. It's measured by value creation. Technology builds prosperity. Innovation, leadership, social networking. We always achieve more value when we move out of our boundaries to learn and to solve problems. Six Sigma, strive for perfection. This is the stuff that matters. Oh, and Newton, too. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dan, for speaking <laughs> I gotta give us. somebody else a chance. Uh, that fellow back there. Let me just, we're gonna do um, the mics as usual, so do wait for the mic to ask your question for the purpose of the camera. Oh, I have a question. You spoke a lot about Six Sigma, and from my experience working for couple companies, Six Sigma can definitely be used in the wrong way. So what, how can you suggest to use Six Sigma in like application to a company to keep it from being more of like a wasteful thing, right. you know, just right. sort of like a name piece? Yeah, if it's not applied from the top down, 
obsessively with major investment, training for everybody. Well, we, we trained um, about a thousand people to be full-time experts. Took one full year, one full year. So you gotta be serious about it and the boss has to know about it. It, it can't be uh, just an add-on. Oh yeah, well we'll do that too. It completely changes the way work takes place. And you have to believe that in the absence of it, we're gonna go bankrupt or have a serious problem. You have, because this is a huge change, but I'm suggesting that if you don't have, I don't care what you call it, if you don't have an obsessive compulsive focus on only doing things that add value and stop all the waste, you've wasted you, which is a crime. My old standby here. This is going to be quite long, but um, <laughs> um, so you speak a lot about um, kind of like competing with the outside world, other co other countries as companies versus the U.S. But um, at the same time, you talk a lot about networking and how that's really important for uh, you know successful, most productive people are the ones who network the most. So maybe instead of trying to compete with them directly, maybe we should focus on networking and just try to work together to provide value and improve for Look, I think that's a really good point and uh, th without question enterprises have to be able to work with other enterprises as well. But my point was more of a personal point that through your training and look you're all smart every engineer in this room is smart. You have to be to be an engineer and to graduate and it takes a lot of work and you've faced a lot of stress in, the, in your courses and your exams. What do you do when you face the stress? You work harder, you study, you study, you get it done. In the, in the world of business, which is a social world, the solution isn't to go back into your shell and work harder, sometimes it is, it's to interact with the other people. And one of my assertions, nobody's taken me up on it, is engineers often love their own company, meaning themselves and get uncomfortable dealing in broader networks. That was the point I was making. More questions? Yes, sir, back there. Oh, Got one well, there. Oh. Yeah, but give this guy a chance here, because, uh, sir, back there. Hi, I was just kind of curious, as you, uh, you're, you uh, uh, instill innovation and motivation and you're tracking all the various factors inside the company, what do you typically use for metrics to decide if you're on track and give you feedback about how well you're doing? Um, it's, of course, a function of any institution, but it's one of the most important things you can decide is how do we measure it. And the old saying, what, measures, what gets measured gets done is really true. Uh, the way that we did it uh, was we would, against our commitments to the customer, again, we start with everything is focused on the customer because that's the definition of quality. Uh, in, in, the, in the world that I grew up in, we managed programs, not products. A program would be like uh, an air traffic control system. We'd have 7,000 going at any one time. We measured our performance against our commitments to the customer on time and on dollars. And uh, because the ultimate measure of productivity is lower cost and less time. So we'd make a commitment to the customer on schedule and cost and we track relentlessly against that. And we expected those commitments to be met or exceeded, meaning achieved or better. So that was our primary metric. Once we put it in, it really, that plus cash, you put those two things together, it really changed things very quickly. Um, did you ever notice a problem with maintaining quality while you're at the same time cutting the waste? No, no we didn't. And not to say we didn't have some quality excursions, but we actually found just the opposite. But one of the reasons that uh, quality can uh, suffer is because you have a very complicated chain of events in an engineering or manufacturing process, lots of different hands to pass it over to. So the, and the more hands you have, the more opportunity there is for it to break or to, for something to happen. If we take a look at that whole process and change it so that all these handoffs don't occur, we dramatically reduce the cycle time and we reduce the opportunity for quality failures. So costs come down, quality goes up. Uh, let's follow right One here. One final question. 
could you comment on the idea that um, technology creates its own applications and those who might create the technology can't foresee those applications? Right. I, I think that there is uh, an, ab an absolute uh, opportunity for that. Uh, I don't know if those geniuses uh, from Stanford who developed Google started off with a belief that Google could be Google and they went out and invented it, solutions to that. I don't think that's how it started. So there are, and I've tried to make the point, there are cases where the Eurekas, meaning technology for technology's sake, pays. But it's so far the exception that you can't design a system around it. The system has to find those kinds of people and cherish them. And don't treat them like everybody else. But the vast majority of innovation requires lots of money to bring it to uh, lots and lots of money to bring it home and requires some kind of focus so that it's not wasted. But it doesn't mean there isn't the occasional technology for technology's sakes creates long-term value. But see, that is such an, a natural predilection anyways for the technical community that I'm trying to push back on that, not to t keep it from happening, but to rein it in because there's always going to be people out there pushing that limit, which is great. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so thank yeah, you, Dan. I've got a problem. I've got to get on a plane to Hong Kong and then Vietnam. And the plane leaves here at 7.22, and I've got to change. So what do you think? I guess I'd better go. Thanks, Dan, for being thank with you. us tonight.